Well, I'd like to welcome, every, welcome everyone to our live stream tonight, where we're going to lift the lid on a very important topic. And that's the topic of women in leadership, especially in the church. As we do with all things at Gordon Conwell, we begin with prayers. So if you'll join me in prayer, I would appreciate it. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for bringing us together this evening. We thank you for our guest, Katie Cole. We thank you for the book that she has written, which has been such an inspiration to so many people. And Lord, we thank you for those who join us live this evening and those who join us via recorded message later. Your Bible, your word is full of examples of women leaders from the very beginning, Deborah and Miriam and Naomi and Hannah and Esther and Ruth and the list goes on and Priscilla and Phoebe and so many. And yet even today, many years later, there are many in the church who are unable to have their voices heard, maybe because of bad theology, maybe because of a form of oppression or prejudice. Whatever the reason, Lord, we pray that you would open hearts and minds tonight so that those women whom you've called to lead will be empowered and encouraged to do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, everyone, welcome. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Sarah Menard who's the Associate Director of the Mockler Center. Sarah, if you give everyone some directions and kick us off and introduce Katie, that would be great. Welcome everybody to Lifting the Lid on Developing Female Leaders in Ministry with Katie Cole. We are um, really delighted to have her and have you all with us tonight. Let me give you a little bit of housekeeping so you know what to expect. Um, there is a chat function where you can add questions that you have during the talk. And then um, about 30 minutes from now, around 740, we'll open it up to your questions, your comments, and a, hopefully a lively discussion with everybody who's joining us live today. Um, we won't be having the video option open, but the audio will be open. And so you can um, uh, ask your question, raise your hand, put it in the chat, and we will um, uh, discuss your question between all of us. And we really look forward to your comments as well and resources, anything that comes up that you wanna share with the community. Uh, we really welcome all of that. So don't hesitate to put your questions in at any time. And, um, but just know that in about 30 minutes, we will turn to you and to your questions and your comments. Katie is an extraordinary person. We have been incredibly blessed to meet recently. Uh, she joined us at the Joanna Mockler Leadership Awards Dinner uh, as one of the steering committee members, which really helped to shape the awards and uh, lead us in a, a really powerful journey of identifying the women leaders and then being able to give them the awards. And so we really couldn't have done that event without her. And through the course of that event, we got to know her a lot, little bit better. Um, she is the founder and CEO of Katie Cullen Company. Um, but really interestingly, um, she comes from a perspective of 25 years in full-time ministry, studying leadership and organizational development, most recently serving as the executive director at one of America's largest and fastest growing multi-site churches, which she talks about a lot in the book. She is passionate about helping local churches and uh, really equipping leaders to fulfill their calling, all leaders without exception. She's a true visionary in that sense of teaching te churches to really harness all of the God-given talents in the congregation, and particularly those of women who um, we will be talking about um, all of the barriers to that tonight, and also some ways to, um, to get around that in terms of how to become a more flourishing congregation. Um, so she is not only an engaging, practical, down-to-earth speaker, um, but she is also an expert in leadership in organizational development and spiritual growth in parenting and in really leading a full life. And so this is as much a, a spiritual formation opportunity for us mm -hmm. as it is um, just to soak in from Katie's, her wisdom, her insights, and of course, her research. And so 
Um, Developing Female Leaders is the title of the book, which uh, you can buy a copy of on her website. We will make sure that the link is there and you get a discount um, by participating this evening. So we'll make sure that's all in the chat for those of you that want um, a, a copy of Katie's book. Without further ado, I'll turn it back over to Ken, who's going to give us an introduction to the Mockler Center, and then we will dive into our discussion. Uh, Ken, you're muted. That was absolutely inevitable. Uh, we're really looking forward uh, to what Katie has to say. And to put it into perspective, um, a few months ago, the Mockler Center Fellows got together and we talked about how we could honor uh, the matron of the Mockler Center, Joanna Mockler, who is the widow of uh, Coleman Mockler, the former chairman and CEO of the Gillette Corporation, who endowed half of my chair at the seminary and all of the Mockler Center, including uh, Sarah's position as well as mine. And we decided one of the things we wanted to do was to honor her by recognizing and honoring other women leaders, um, especially here in the Boston area, but even beyond. And so for the rest of this academic year, uh, in addition to Katie and this conversation, we are going to be introducing you folks out there uh, to these magnificent women who were given awards because of their leadership in the public square. So we will have Dr. Rosalind Picard, for instance, from MIT, who was one of the recipients, be a guest uh, on this show. We're going to have Kristen Colbert Baker uh, from the Mars Corporation, who is going to talk about her life of uh, empowering people, including and especially women in the corporate world. Uh, Tish Harrison Warren, uh, who uh, many of you know from her article in the New York Times, um, a church leader, uh, an, uh, an ordained Anglican priest, uh, and a real social commentator who, as she often says, is surprised by the fact that she talks about Jesus in the New York Times. Uh, and last but not least, Dr. Gloria White Hammond, uh, Dr. Hammond is a local Boston woman who is a medical doctor. She is um, a professor at uh, Harvard Divinity as well, and a co-pastor with her husband at uh, an AME church uh, in the Boston area. So four fantastic women. Uh, and it just gives you a sense of what we try to do at the Mockler Center, which is to engage with the public square, faith, work, economics, justice, you name it, that's what we try to do. So that's why Katie is here. Katie, tell us, why'd you write this book? And you're muted. Yes, okay, we're, I'm just taking turns with you, Ken. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Ken and Sarah, for having me. And it's so great to see all of you uh, who are here live. And I know um, many people will be joining us later. So it is such an honor uh, to be connected and in relationship with you all. I had such a fantastic time serving on the committee for the award ceremony. And of course, uh, the award recipients, I just want to give a shout out. They will be amazing to hear from. I feel like we could have stayed there all night uh, learning from them and getting their wisdom. So I will be looking forward to those upcoming chats as well. Uh, but yes, thank you for the opportunity to come on and talk about this topic and about the uh, research that we did that ended up turning into this book, Developing Female Leaders. Uh, it has really been a fun passion project for me the last few years, uh, mostly because to be really honest, uh, I haven't really been someone that's been super um overt in their championing of women. And part of that is in my own journey. I grew up in some very conservative environments. Um, I did get a master's degree in human resource development as part of my graduate work. And my church recruited me to come on staff as we were growing rapidly. And it was sort of my introduction into ministry. Um, I never really knew that people got paid to be in ministry. I didn't know you could major in ministry at college. I kind of grew up in just this very um, uh, un- aware space in a tiny little church in Montana. And so as I was kind of diving into these experiences, I was networking with other churches. I was trying to lead in a, a really amazing church that I loved. I was running into these boundaries and barriers that to be really honest, I was kind of a classic female leader in that it really made me question myself. 
Um, and obviously I was a young leader. I had a lot to learn, but as I look back now, and as I've been studying the research on this and talking with hundreds and hundreds of women who are leading in, uh, various environments, particularly church environments, how common it is for, uh, us to find resistance or to find barriers or to be walking into a space where a woman hasn't walked before. And when it doesn't go absolutely perfectly, we question ourselves and our own abilities, and it causes us to doubt our capacity as leaders. And so as I've been uh, journeying this in my own way, and then as I uh, started consulting with other churches and uh, speaking more on leadership development and on helping churches fulfill their mission or maybe go multi-site or add to their leadership development systems, I started having these really unique conversations, which were very strange to me. It would usually be a senior pastor or executive pastor or the two of them together would want to sit and have lunch with me at this conference or this networking meeting. And as the only woman in these rooms, most of the time, that was a very unusual experience. I usually didn't have people uh, wanting to sit and have lunch with me. Not that, uh, you know, I wasn't having flashbacks from middle school cafeteria days, but it was, um, there was a certain level of awkwardness that I think I had become so accustomed to. I didn't even really uh, notice it as much. Um, but when they wanted to sit and eat with me and ask me questions about the women that they had on their team or these young leaders that were uh, coming up through their pipeline, or they have these really sharp leaders who are really in their church, love their church, volunteering in their church, and they would love to have them on staff, but those women are hesitant to do that. They just had all of these questions and uh, it was wonderful conversations. I was really impressed by the number of pastors who were trying to make headway in this topic, particularly when they were from uh, cultures, uh, cultural contexts, or churches that historically had not welcomed a lot of women into leadership. But I found my found myself um, stumbling a little bit over how to explain to them how some of these ideas they had were maybe not the best ideas in the world, <laughs> because they were really smart men. They were really godly uh leaders, they cared deeply about their church and they were trying to do the right thing. But um, inevitably I would get sort of the senior pastor who was like, we have this sharp woman and we want her to leave her marketplace job and come on staff. And I want to teach her ministry. I know she could be a great, powerful leader here. Uh, so I'm going to make her my assistant so she can come to all the meetings and hear all the conversations and learn all about ministry for a few years and then help me lead this church. And it was hard for me to explain to him why that was not the best way to help her grow in her leadership or to gain authority among the congregation or, um, or, uh, even that that's the correct background for the kind of role that you see her in. Like, how can we sort of bridge the gap and put her in a pathway that actually helps her lead and have a greater impact in your church and in the kingdom? Uh, we had a lot of examples of women uh, who were uh, getting married and having families. And that was a very awkward conversation for pastors to know what to do with them. They didn't know how to bring it up um, and still honor women and also, you know, not break any laws. So there were those kinds of conversations. And really, at the end of the day, uh, I found that we were just all very ignorant. We we knew we wanted to do something different. Um, I knew there was way more that we could be offering women. And at the same time, as we were working with these churches, they were trying to fulfill the mission that God had given them, the vision that they had for their church. And the number one issue that they were running into was not enough money. It was not enough vision. It was not having great opportunities in their community. It was not having enough leaders. And so these two conversations at the same time were just so compelling to me that really, if we could solve these with each other, we would really go so much further faster. And so um, part of it, like I said, is I just was not brought up in an environment where women uh, were seen as equal in leadership spaces or were given opportunities. For some reason, God just opened doors for me to be able to be at very high levels of leadership and serve on the executive team uh, at a really wonderful church. But again, I was the only woman serving in those kinds of levels. Uh, and so I decided to do a deep dive on the topic. I wasn't thinking of writing a book. I was really just trying to help these churches and these pastors who had come to me with this dilemma of what do we do and how can I help them do a better job in what they're doing? 
And so I did a big deep dive in, in the research in academia in ministry in the marketplace, which there is, um, if anyone has been studying this or looked at this at all, there is so much wonderful research and just incredibly eye-opening insights from it. Uh, and then I also sent out a survey, uh, online. I kind of was hoping to get about a, a hundred women to fill it out. And in about two weeks, we had over 1200 women who were leaders in their churches, fill out this survey to give us kind of an understanding of, uh, at the time it was in 20. 19. Uh, where are you? What have been the things that have been most helpful? What's the common challenges you're facing? Uh, what would be great for the guys to know about your experience? What do you wish you had now? Uh, looking back in your history, what, what were those kind of key moments that really helped you accelerate into leadership? What were those things that distracted you or uh, uh, disappointed you or, or kind of defeated your spirit in the process. And so through all of that, we, um, put together, um, what now has become developing female leaders, this book where we take really, um, all of that information and turn it into eight best practices, um, from interviews that we did with pastors and female leaders and those churches who are doing a great job in this. What are those best practices that we can all do, uh, to do a better job? And as we were kind of uncovering this, what we found is that uh, the topic that most people think is the biggest issue for women in leadership, particularly in church environments or faith-based environments, is that it's a theological one, that we have different theologies on this and that uh, there's sort of like people who are for women and people who are kind of against women leading. And, and those are the two options. And what we discovered in our research is that uh, our theological positions actually had almost zero bearing on how good we were doing as organizations and as churches, elevating and training women into leadership. Uh, we had very uh, conservative churches who had women leading at all levels of the organization, including the executive team. We had some very progressive and egalitarian churches where there were almost no women serving, even though their theology uh, welcomes women and actually dictates that they be empowering women and to serve in leadership. Uh, so what we started to find is that we actually just not good at this kind of all across the board, generally speaking. Um, and so we have a lot to learn in terms of how we lead our cultures, how we as leaders practice uh, some of these best practices. Uh, and so that's what it really ended up coming down to is the individual practices of the leader and the kinds of cultures they created. So again, it wasn't theology, it was my individual practices as a leader. So obviously if you're a lead pastor or a senior pastor, a district leader in your denomination, uh, your individual individual practices not only affect your own team, but the leadership influence that you have and the kind of culture that you build. Or you could be a team leader who's volunteering as the head of the ushers and your individual practices and the kinds of culture you make on your team also really changes the ability for women to rise in leadership and what we're teaching about our theology. Uh, so that's really where the, the book uh, was birthed from. Um, we, I sent it out into the world, uh, kind of wondering if I was going to get uh, slightly from some of my peers or some of the cultures that I come from, but I am really uh, happy to share that uh, it was really met with wide open arms. The book took off in sales way more than any of us really thought it would. Um, but more importantly, the emails and the messages on social media and the people I get to talk to when I speak on this, just the number of people who have really decided to champion this in their own local church, the number of particularly male leaders who um, I believe God has really been stirring in their hearts for a while. They wanted to do something. They knew that what they were seeing wasn't exactly right. They have women in their own lives, their wives or daughters that they're raising or women that they work with that they know have uh, equal capacity to lead as they do. And they just weren't quite sure how to do it. And so I'm a very practical person. I do a lot of how to's. Uh, and so I really wrote the book for men who want to do a better job, but have just not been exposed to the research or have just not understood the right questions to ask. Or, um, what I find most often is they have had such an incredible experience growing up in the church and being uh, given leadership opportunities, sometimes from a very early age, they went to wonderful schools and seminaries. They uh, got hired on at churches with a lot of leaders who mentored them. And that experience is so positive and so ingrained that it's oftentimes hard for them to imagine anyone serving in ministry who hasn't had something like that. And almost every woman I talk to who leads in, in uh, the church or in leadership 
particularly in male populated environments, has had very different experiences. And so um, those are some of the things that we try to sort of uh, shine light on, bring awareness to, uh, feed research into so that we can talk about some of those big key pieces and give us all language and all a better understanding of what women are really experiencing. And those of us who are in leadership, uh, men and women, what can we do to unlock those doors? What can we do to encourage and empower in really specific ways that help uh, release more leadership potential into the kingdom? Wonderful. Thank you for that. So let me ask you a question. You know, at, at Gordon Conwell, which is an unabashed evangelical theological seminary, A.J. Gordon, from whom we get Gordon in Gordon Conwell, in the 19th century was a leader, a pioneer in the ordination of women. A generation later, we had Roger Nicole, literally a giant in reformed biblical theology. These men are giants in biblical theology. Again, like A.J. Gordon, a champion of women in ministry. When I was on the Amazon website looking at some of the reviews of your book, and by the way, you got a lot of great reviews, <laughs> uh, hundreds and hundreds of five-star reviews, I noticed that most of the people were women who were writing these reviews. And I know what it's like in my life and in my position. Sometimes I feel like I'm pushing water up a hill on this topic. Help me. What are men not getting? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, that's a big question. I think uh, what I just mentioned about just the um, the difference in our growing up in leadership and experiences is one of them. So really, it's a it's an issue of just being unaware of the issue or unaware that uh, for most women, a lot of doors are closed. And uh, like I have many experiences I share in the book where uh, there were people who actually discouraged me from leading or um, maybe didn't give me the same opportunities as my uh, my uh, male peers were getting. And so those kinds of opportunities are sometimes baked into our cultures. They're sort of uh, handed down in our practices. And most men um, are unaware of what those are. And so there's a lot of just unconscious bias, um, not just in our behavior, but in our systems that really discourage women along the way. And so I would say that would be one of them. Um, another one, uh, one of the pieces, my favorite uh, elements of research in the book is uh, around what we call the sticky floor. So uh, you've probably heard of the glass ceiling, those, those structures and barriers that kind of keep women out oftentimes. In the church world, we call it the stained glass ceiling. Uh, and, and, but on the opposite end of that is what we call the sticky floor, which are those conversations and thoughts that women have in their own minds that keep their feet stuck from the floor and prevent them from moving forward for opportunities. So one of the research pieces talks about how men and women apply for jobs differently. Uh, men, when they look at a job description, if they feel confident of about 60% on a job description, they apply for it. They kind of, they'll figure they'll probably get it. They'll kind of fake it till they make it. They go for it. Uh, women, when they look at a job description, they have to feel confident of 100% of what's on there from the first day or they don't even apply for the job. So they don't even put their name in the hat. And when you're working in a place like a church, especially where we get a lot of our leaders from our volunteer pool um, or from other people who are applying for jobs within our staff teams, uh, we want people to apply for the job. And many times women are not putting their name in the hat. They're not going for things. They're not thinking of themselves as being as capable as some of the men are. And so uh, so that is a huge, usually a big eye opener for most of the men that we have to recruit women differently. If you're wanting women on your team, it can't just be an ad somewhere or an announcement. You have to sit down and talk to women who are great leaders in your congregation and explain to them, hey, we have this opening and we actually think you'd be perfect. Let me explain why. You might be thinking that you're not meeting the qualifications, but I already see this giftedness in you. I already see this calling in your life and I know you would be great for this. Those conversations will change the trajectory of a female leader's life for her life. Uh, and we have very few of those kind of baked into our culture and baked into our systems. And so those are the kinds of things that I think men are unaware of and, and just how big of an issue that is. Uh, I do think one of the things that is really turning the tide on this conversation for many male leaders, particularly higher level leaders, is they have daughters who are uh, coming of age, who are teenagers going to college, uh, going to seminary and are coming back and they're like, dad, it's not the same for me, 
or I don't know where I fit in your church. And these are girls, they train to be leaders. They've seen leadership in them since they were four. They ran all of their student camps. They went to college on scholarships and their daughters are having a hard time finding their place, are getting no's, are getting rejected for jobs, that they know these young women and they believe in them and they're seeing the disparity. And that is opening up a lot of dad's hearts <laughs> to make changes and champion because it's personal and they see it and they feel it on their kids' behalf. And so I think that's part of what God is doing in sort of this movement to really see a lot more um, conversations, a lot more open doors, a lot more shifts. Uh, we see, a, uh, I'm surprised to see as many Many churches, as I've seen, make shifts in their theology uh, because of this very issue. And in the book, I actually try to be very endorsing of everyone's theology. I'm not a theologian, so I'm not really interested. I'll let other people have the big debate about it. Um, but I actually think we have a lot more ways of looking at this theological question. And I do try to make a case for that in the book to just give ourselves better dialogue and think of it less as like a binary choice and more as a spectrum that really has to do with who we are as a church and our history, the culture um, that we're engaging and what it is that we believe God is calling us to. Those are all pieces that we need to take a second look at. That's wonderful. And, and as you may recall at the dinner, um, we comped any professor's daughter who wanted to come to that dinner uh, and also a lot of uh, local Gordon College students, women students, we come to them because we wanted them to see yes. and hear from these incredible role models like Dr. Picard and the other women that I mentioned. So thank you very much for helping open our eyes because um, I think also we get into a lot of bad habits. You know, uh, I've been invited to countless men only prayer breakfasts and things. And I've gotten to the point now where unless the topic is men's sexuality, I refuse to go to men only events uh, because it's just bad habits. Uh, and, and I'm happy to say that, you know, I've been able to convince some people to open it up. And once women are part of the group, the group flourishes. It does so much better. Uh, and so that's just sort of a a little personal uh, experience of mine. And I hope some people who are, are watching online will think, you know what, maybe I'm going to do the same thing with those things that I'm invited to. So it's a suggestion. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. Sarah, I think you have some questions. And don't forget to unmute your mic. <laughs> Katie, your, um, your book is so rich. I would love to hear a little bit more about your research. Um, mm -hmm. So what else did you find? I mean, having 1,200 respondents is pretty great. Um, I'd love to know a little bit more about the demographics of those 1200. Um, mm -hmm. And if there are any variations that you've seen, um, you know, and what else did you what I mean, we know from the book sort of what, what were the big issues, but I'd love to hear more from you, because a lot of us on the call might not have actually read your book and don't know the data as well as you do. What else were the big ahas from the data? Yeah, uh, I unfortunately, I don't know the demographics I'm at my fingertips. I will say that um, because it was done on social media, it wasn't the most um, steady uh, population group. So we kind of uh, talk about it with that, um, knowing that. But um, one of the things that was really interesting in some of the qualitative responses uh, was just the heartache that so many women have. I think I was really struck by um, just the the intensity of experiences that women have had um, and the the number of hits that most women take in their leadership life. It was it was really um, palpable. You could you could feel the emotion and the um, and the strength of these women to stay in ministry and to persevere uh, despite some of these really significant challenges. And um, so that was an interesting point. And I think most when I talk to men a lot um, about how to do a better job at this or what are some of those ways to really uh, open up their eyes to it, it's it, I really encourage them to talk to some female leaders in their church and ask them, you know, what is it like to be a female leader here and be ready for the story that might surprise you. Um, so that would be the first thing. Uh, the second thing uh, from our research that we found, and I would love to study all of these things more, by the way, the research nerd in me would love to go deeper on this. Uh, but one of them was that, uh, uh, excuse me, one second, my son is 
urgently needing an answer. Okay. My apologies for the double tasking here. <laughs> um, the uh, most women who were able to sort of um, uh, break through either that stained glass ceiling or uh, work at a church, maintain a staff role at a church. Uh, all of them had one thing in common in their experience. And that was that they had someone affirm leadership in them before the age of 19. So at some point early in their life, they, someone used the word leadership in their life. It could have been a coach. It was rarely from church, but it was a coach. It was a teacher. It was a parent. Uh, and the impact of that, that their, as their identity was forming in their teenage years, that, um, image of being a leader was sort of branded into who they knew themselves to be and who they knew God made them to be. And that seemed to be one of the most important factors of women who actually were able to kind of make it through those hits and keep on going. And those women who who aspired to leadership, but um, sort of quit or sort of fell out or kind of laid low in the church space um, and questioned whether or not they were actually a leader. So I found that really fascinating. I think we're seeing a lot more of that happen as we do a better job working with younger populations of women leaders, especially in churches. Um, this new group of uh, Generation Alpha raised by millennials and young Gen Xers, they have a completely different experience um, because of sort of the the awareness that most moms have had and uh, schools and churches have had for young women. Uh, but that is a significant piece and something that I think all of us can do a, a intentional job around of affirming that in all of the young adults and all of the teenagers uh, that we see. Those were the two biggest things that really stood out from the research. Thanks. That's really helpful. Um, it raises a question that I have, which is, um, you know, in my experience, I always feel like there's this invisible line that mm -hmm. you can't cross. You can't get too strong. You can get strong. We'll give you some leadership. We'll give you some authority, but you can't get too strong. You can't be too, you know, you have to say, sorry, you have to back up. You have to be able to be, um, genteel, right? You have to be able to be soft in the right way. And, and so back to your, you know, you do so much beautiful work in the book about dismantling stereotypes that are really harmful. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, there's a lot of pushback right now in the culture of all of that, but the fact is they're harmful and they're in, and, and language does matter. Words do matter. Actions matter as much, but language does matter. And it does shape our mindsets. As you said mm -hmm. in the book, it's really mm -hmm. important. But from your experience, like, what is that line? And particularly, I'm thinking in the evangelical world, right? Like, mm -hmm. it feels like there's a, what is the line from your experience? Like, and how do we characterize that? And how do we remove it? Yeah, well, I always say, you know, the 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 sin that's hard to come back from from a male pastor is an affair. Although we seem to be getting, um, it's not as hard as it used to be. But for women, the line you can't cross is is being too strong or wanting too much or being too forceful. And I think a lot of it is around this idea that once you step, that imaginary line is very real, and once you step over it, it's really hard to come back from it. And the effect that we see on that cultural line is women very qualified women, very talented women, uh, very anointed women will lead way below wherever that line is. So sometimes that line is a theological line. There are some churches that have really clear boundaries around uh, um, sort of leadership levels that women are allowed to aspire to. But most of it is what you're talking about. It's more cultural, and it usually has very little to do with that theology. And what I challenge uh, people to do in the book and when I speak is to really clearly define that theological piece. Um, most of it is assumed in churches, and um, most senior pastors think that it's much clearer in the culture than it is. To them, it seems very obvious. This is how I treat women. This is what we do. This is what we believe. But the further you get away from the senior pastor's office, the lower and lower that standard goes and the less and less is tolerated for women. And so that's why those cultures that we're setting are really important. So clarifying your theology, again, whatever your theology is, there's room to, to move. <laughs> there's room to get more. And so um, being able to clarify that theology and then really talk about how that applies in the cultural context. So we saw a lot of stories come in about 
uh, women who were, you know, serving on the greeter team or were teaching a Sunday school class. But if there was a hint of things where they felt like they wanted to do more or offer more or make a suggestion or do anything that was critical, they got their hands slapped for that or they got put in their place for that. Uh, women who weren't allowed to teach in rooms where there wasn't sort of an oversight present, even though their theology didn't necessarily dictate that they were kind of bound to this like approval process. So those are the things that as leaders, again, we can really clarify that theology and then talk about how we want to see that play out. And then educating, we find that the leaders who um, sort of have the worst habits are middle managers. And so in the church world, that tends to be a uh, uh, frontline pastors, people who are leading volunteer teams. And so they're teaching theology by their practices around women to their volunteer teams, much more than what we hear on Sunday morning or in a, in a class or in a small group. And so making sure our behaviors really matches our theological viewpoint, because theological is um, theology is learned intellectually, but it's also learned practically and in relationship. And so that's actually where it gets imprinted the most. Um, so that's where we have a lot of room to grow in all of our churches. Really powerful. Thank you so much for that. Over to you, Ken. Yeah, Katie, uh, you know, my background is in the corporate world before I was a, a professor. And um, I found that the hierarchical model is becoming quite passe in the corporate world. And we're seeing a lot more teamwork and a lot more interdepartmental interaction and people operating as peers. Uh, in the church, we're stuck in an old model. We're stuck in a very hierarchical, you know, the, the sort of sage on the stage, senior pastor, and then there's the other pastors, and then there's the laity, and then there's the youth, you know, etc. I have to believe if the church is going to survive, much less thrive in the 21st century, we're going to have to get out of that model. And again, in my experience in the corporate world, the more diverse the team, the more highly effective the team. And I'm wondering, as a consultant to churches, um, are you seeing this trend? And do you think that's an opportunity for uh, the church to kill two birds with one stone, as it were, <laughs> empower women and change this model? Uh, 100% yes. I think you're definitely onto something. Uh, so what's been really interesting in sort of just church research is that most of what people are missing from their church that's causing them to leave is a lack of connection, a lack of relationship, um, a lack of a sense of a community, uh, lack of collaboration and decision making, all the things that you're talking about, which just happen to be the things that women tend to naturally bring to teams and organizations. And so it was funny, a couple of years ago, I was at a conference and uh, I didn't quite know I was walking into this scenario, but they actually had me on stage um, as sort of like the pro woman person and a very conservative, well known pastor who was sort of a uh, more traditional viewpoint. And they were kind of trying to pit us against each other, actually, which that is not my goal at all. <laughs> I'm actually trying to help men and women lead together. I think it's the together piece that is the, the missing link, to kind of to what you're pointing to. Um, but at the same time, in this in this conference, they were talking about all this research about how teams need to be more collaborative, how they need to be moving. It's how we're going to reach the next generation. Uh, generation Y and Z are are very integrated, really focus on diversity, uh, really work collaboratively. They've been raised in school in mostly group work. So that is the way they're entering the marketplace. And it's the way we have to become intergenerational in all of our team settings. And you're right, the church is becoming more, uh, tends to be resistant to that. And so so as we were talking about this in the in the conference and kind of having this very intense but awkward conversation, uh, that was really the, the key point is that um, it's the same issue, that as we bring more women, more diversity, more people of color, more people of different ages, I feel like ageism is one of the untalked about forms of uh, bias in our churches. We either have churches that 
um, overemphasize youth where uh, people age out of ministry by the time they hit 40 or 45. And it's all about people in their 20s in every role. Or we have people who um, don't want to let anyone under 45 lead. And it's still it's kind of the the um, the older generation is still ruling everything. We really need all of those folks to come together. And so um, there are many benefits, as you mentioned, to having diversity on our teams. And much of what I think God has even accelerated in the uh, pandemic and sort of, um, especially in America, some of the challenges we've been going through, uh, particularly in churches, we do kind of hit all of those birds with one stone when we add all of our congregation and use all of their giftings in all of the places in the church. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we're going to open it up, by the way, now to anybody who wants to go into the chat and ask a question. Uh, that's probably the easiest way to do it. But in the meantime, uh, I have another question for you, Katie. Um, in your book, you talk about the relationship between spiritual formation and leadership. And I found that really quite fascinating, as though they're two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can unpack that a little bit, because I just think that is, that's, that's really a, a, a nugget of gold there. If you could elaborate on that, please. Sure. So as we're uh, growing up, particularly if we have the opportunity to grow up in the church, but but even uh, just as uh, if you're a newer believer, you come to faith in, as an adulthood, those two things are leadership development, um, the gifts that God has given us, the calling he has on our life, the role we play in our local church body, and our spiritual formation really are designed to go together. Uh, they bounce back and forth. They integrate. It's really hard to grow as a leader if you aren't also growing in your prayer life. It's really hard to grow spiritually if you aren't living out your, uh, your faith in more practical ways and influencing other people. So uh, sharing your faith with an unbeliever or leading in some capacity, they really go together. And most men, the point I make in the book is almost all men grow up with those two things highly, highly integrated. And so the, you were talking about those prayer breakfasts, uh, those men's prayer breakfasts or the, the men's ministry. They often talk about leadership. In fact, they're almost exclusively leadership based conversations in those environments. Um, and so women have a very different experience. Uh, because we tend to segment out leadership development and spiritual formation. And this is sort of a leftover in culture. So people will have different experiences with this, but um, I would say it's, it's very normal in most, especially evangelical churches for there to be a women's ministry, which is all spiritual formation, almost uh, no leadership concepts are talked about in the actual content that's taught. There's maybe some leadership development, like we need small group leaders, but it's often like all in a room and you're basically facilitating three questions at the end of a conversation. It's it's when it comes to leadership development and how far you can take someone with gifts in that capacity. It's it's very it's a uh, very base baseline, um, but. We don't often have leadership spaces where women are welcome. So many women with great leadership gifts in churches have a lot of spiritual development. They've done every Beth Moore study. They've read through the Bible in a year, multiple times. They can, you know, chapter and verse on almost anything you want to talk about. But in terms of actually putting that into action in their local church, very, very small impact unless it's children's ministry. And so that's the piece that I think if we could integrate those more together, if we could help women have more leadership in their in women's spaces or I'm a little bit I lean where you are Ken I'm like I'm not sure gender separation is the right way to go I think it's the togetherness and the integration where we're growing together in our leadership we're growing together spiritually the that John 17 vision that Jesus has for us to be one to be unified to be together that's actually the thing he says that will make a difference in the world lost people will look at that at that togetherness and know how much God loves them. That's the thing that will make the difference. I always say when, if I were Jesus and I were praying at the end of my life and looking at us, the, the disciples yet to come in the state of the church today, I would pray for a lot of things. And I probably would never once think of unity. I would think of revival and I would think of prayer warriors and of strategists and of leaders, but unity is not what I would think about. And that's the thing he wants for us. And so unifying not only in our development, but unifying in our togetherness and how we lead and grow. We need, we need each other to be everything God's called us to be. That's well, great. Let me, let me two, just say very quickly, Sarah, if I may just, just very quickly comment on that, just to okay. let you know, at Gordon Conwell, we do our discipleship groups, which is part of our spiritual formation 
intergenerationally and uh, uh, multi-gender. It's really important. And that's the way mm -hmm. we do it. And we have found it works very well. Sorry to uh, uh, cut No, in. I just want to make sure we get a couple questions in and also um, you know, give folks a chance to, to ask more questions as well. Um, we've got two questions in the, in the Q&A, which actually sort of dovetail with each other in a way. Uh, we've got one from Gwen, which is about sort of if we're going to invite women into men's only groups, should we invite men into women's only groups? And how do we do that in a way that um, sort of respects the uniqueness of men and women because they're both different. And then, of course, Beatrice also follows up and says, is there a difference between how a woman leads and a man leads? Are there distinctive markers? What uniqueness do women bring in leadership? And then I'd just sort of add to that, like, does it matter? You know, like, <laughs> does it matter that there's differences? Like, and how does that, how in your research have you sort of brought that to the fold? So, so both Gwen and Beatrice's questions um, sort of are, are really useful and helpful. So thanks to you both. And let's hear your answer, Katie. Yes, that's great. So um, I do, I think there are a couple different ways of looking at this. And so I just want to be clear there, there is a lot of research around some of the uniquenesses that women tend to bring to the table. Um, for me personally, though, I think because I am someone who uh, uh, my giftedness tends to not fit the mold of most women. Um, I have probably leaned on a different take on it, which is really, I find in the research that I look at that leadership and our contribution is much more personality driven than gender driven. And a piece of that is we still have some leftover gender role um, variations that from our country that really inform the way women show up into leadership spaces that may or may not be fully accurate around gender. So I think the jury's out on that particular topic a little bit. Um, but what we do see in the research is when we add diversity and include women, we do get a lot more collaboration. We do get better decision making that lasts longer and doesn't need to be redone. Uh, we do have uh, more uh, higher morale and more um, uh, longevity of employment, so or uh, participation on a team, and so we tend to make better decisions faster, have more creative solutions when we add diversity to the team. Um, so I was mentioning earlier, women do tend to bring different styles of communication. They tend to be more collaborative, um, but I've also seen research where adding women to the team and bringing those kinds of things actually changes the behavior of men to be more collaborative and be better communicators. So I think the jury's still a little out um, because of our kind of our cultural history. Uh, when it comes to bringing uh, men onto women's teams, I am a big champion of that. In fact, I remember uh, in one of my early church roles, I was working with the discipleship pastor who was uh, oversaw all of our discipleship environments, including women's ministry. And I was going to this conference about the innovation around women's ministry. And I was interested in that because I wasn't happy with what we were creating now. And so I took him with me because I'm like, obviously he's in charge of this department. He should go to the conference. He was the only male at the conference. And I was so shocked that, because I knew every one of these women's ministries reported to a male pastor. Like I, I knew that they did. And, uh, but none of them were attending the future of women's ministry. And so I think that kind of disconnection is not serving us well at all. And so I really encourage uh, participation because we do um, not just as gender, but as individuals and as authority figures, we bring different kinds of perspective to the table. Um, I've led a team of all men where I was the only woman. I've led a team of all women where I had one man on the team and it was challenging in both areas. Um, and so I think part of what we have to do is sort of kind of push through the awkwardness and the difficulty of it. In uh, some of the newer research that's out that talks about um, the power of diversity really happens at about 30 to 40% on the team. So you don't need 50% women, 50% men, 50% uh, other things. You just want, uh, if you have 10 people on your team, you want three to four of those people to not be like the majority. You probably have a majority in your church or in your business or in your team. You want three to four or 30 to 40% of them not to be the majority. That's when we really start to see the difference. So as you invite male in, men into your team, just like I recommend when you bring women in, if you're going to take the plunge, at least bring two people on at the same time, because the power of that um, in terms of the diversity ratio and the comfort level of the people and the ability to get away from gender bias increases exponentially when you bring two people on. So instead of looking at the team of men with Katie on the team and it's like, ooh, Katie's got a problem or that must be what women are like, you put 
Katie and Sarah on the team and I react one way and Sarah reacts another. And all of a sudden gender is not to blame or not the issue anymore. Now we've just got great leaders having great conversations, bringing our experiences to the table. That's terrific. We have a question from Elise and Pastor Lenita Tiong. But before we get to both Elise and Pastor Lenita Tiong's questions, I have to do a follow up on that, Katie, because I feel like one of the undercurrents of both of these previous questions comes at this idea of how do we address the conflict of mm -hmm. the language that's hurtful from both sides? Um, you know, so you're in a group and you want to bring the men in to have diversity. And yet, you know, um, the language that, that they're using is, um, is still within a stereotypical way that actually undermines women's identity, women's leadership, women's strength. Um, it's so often that you bring the one guy in the room and he still dominates the conversation, even though he's not the brightest bulb in the group, right? <laughs> so, so how, I mean, so this is part of it is like, how do we get better? And this is obviously extends to, to race and class. And how do we yeah. get better at calling folks in to conversations about language mm -hmm. where it doesn't sound self-righteous, right? And where it really is an invitation to say, I'd love for you to have empathy and compassion for how I might be feeling around that. Do you have any tips uh, for both men and women on how to do that more elegantly and, and in, a more, in a more sort of Christ honoring way? Because it's <laughs> language is really tricky. Yeah, language is important. How we how we address one another, how we interact with each other. It's it's the formation of our relationships. And so um, a couple of suggestions. I do have a lot more in the book, I will say. But one of the most important things, I think, is to just acknowledge that it is difficult and it is a minefield and it is very emotionally charged, really for all people, because we're we're creating change. And when you are a leader and you are instigating change of any kind, you have to lead it very carefully. Carefully. And I think sometimes the awkwardness of this or the uncertainty about what to say or what not to say prevents us from talking about it. And therefore it prevents us from leading change effectively. So if we can think of it more about like, I'm leading change in the team, just like I would, if we were doing a big project, or just like I would, if we were going to reorganize the church and, you know, undo our org chart and reassemble, I would lead it very carefully. I would start early. I would introduce the concepts. I'd read a book together. I'd get common language. I get a vocabulary around it. I talk about things proactively. I'd play out scenarios. I'd then I'd introduce it slowly. I would do a lot of debriefing. You cannot rush good change. That's the, the biggest challenge to change is you don't want to go too slow where you're not actually moving, but you don't want to go too fast that you don't allow people to adapt to it. And everyone adapts at a different pace. And so that's, that's the hard part of change. And so I think that's the first thing is to go, if you're going to do this, you have to acknowledge the bigness of what you're doing and the, um, you're changing the spiritual climate of your team. And so it requires prayer. It requires a humble spirit. It requires, uh, going to people and preventing conflict. It goes to, it requires going to people and, and, and apologizing for conflict. It, it requires all of those spiritual disciplines because it is spiritual work. And so we have to go after it in that dimension. Um, I think the other piece I would say is, uh, as serious and as intense as that is, is to also make it okay to make a mistake or okay to build some camaraderie around it. I I, I often use family um, metaphors and examples when I talk about leadership in church, because we really are designed to be a family. We're a relational organization. And so uh, if you had two kids and you know two boys in your family and you were having a third baby and bringing in a daughter, there's probably some conversations you would have about that. There would be some expectations you would set. You would give your kids language and a role to play with their baby sister that might be different than if it were another brother or if you only ever had two kids and were bringing a puppy in. Like there, you would you would lead it differently. And so I think we it requires that same kind of intentionality that we're not only changing the work dynamics, uh, we're changing the communal experience. And affinity is so much easier than diversity. It's just so much easier. It feels like more fun because it kind of is sometimes like the jokes go faster. The meetings go quicker. You can look at someone and read their mind. Uh, but 
but it's not the place we want to stay. And so part of that spiritual formation that I've uh, really tried to champion is affinity is what we do when people are young in the faith or young in leadership, because you have to be able to see yourself and connect with someone, but you stay immature if you don't move to diversity diversity is where maturity is. And so with our teams, even casting that vision, that that's really the goal. We're all going to get better leader, become better leaders and do better work if we have each other. So all of those things are kind of those basic leadership concepts, but we have to do it very intentionally and, uh, and consistently in order to see it happen successfully. Your chapter, Be the Other, is really powerful, by the way. Mm. Just shout out to that in the book. Um, I'd love to un unmute Elise and have her ask her question live. Elise, can you unmute yourself? Hi, yeah, of course. Um, I would love to. Okay, so the question was, uh, in your experience with churches and things, have you seen an organizational structure for churches that actually favors women leadership? Um, because a lot of churches follow the pyramid model and that does not seem to do that. Yeah, Elise, it's good to see you, by the way, or hear your voice, at least. Um, so, yeah, that kind of hierarchical pyramid model that Ken was talking about, um, that is, uh, you can refer to that even sometimes as like um, the Moses or Old Testament model, right? There's like a guy on top that goes to hear from God and comes and kind of like shoots the vision down and 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 sends it down. I would say most churches and uh, where more people are headed is more towards an apostolic model where it's more collaborative. The Holy Spirit comes to each of us. It's a greater emphasis on uh, like theological teachings around the priesthood of believers versus maybe sort of um, kind of prophet style, pro priest prophet style leadership. Um, so that it would be sort of the theological underpinning is that more apostolic model. I don't know that I would say it favors women over men. I would say it favors collaboration and togetherness and giftedness and anointing over gender. Um, but with that said, uh, most organizations do have some sort of hierarchical authoritarian authoritative structure that's part of how we function and how, who, how payroll happens and all those sorts of things. I think the piece that um, we see the most growth and opportunity for women is when leaders have taken time to uh, promote women into higher level roles of leadership so that you see women leading at every level of the organization. Uh, it's not necessarily an organizational structure. It's more the culture and the style of leadership that takes that organizational system and makes pathways for women to thrive in that. That's super helpful. Okay, thank you so much. That's great. Um, Pastor Lenita, your question um, on um, spiritual formation and women groups and how to um, encourage teenagers and younger women to take up leadership roles. Um, Jason, can we unmute Pastor Lenita? If she's still, or if they're still with us. They might have left. Let me see. Um, Okay. Uh, no, I'm here. Great. Wonderful. Hi. Welcome. All right. Hi. Yeah. Good morning. I'm in another part of the world. It's morning here in Malaysia. Uh, wonderful. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. Um, Oh, I, I like the way, um, Kenny, you talk about spiritual formation versus leadership in women's group. Uh, you, you're very correct. Even here in this part of our world, uh, in women's group, we often talk about uh, spiritual formation. And, um, uh, and I guess because we're wired by the uh, creation narrative of women being made as helpers. So we, we have fantastic helpers, you know, but um, how can we encourage uh, teenagers and younger women to take up leadership roles like in, you know, youth groups, uh, in, in uh, we have Girls Brigade here, uh, and then um, uh, we have um, teenagers, you know, uh, uh, younger, young, younger youth. So usually, even in, in, in such groups, the leaders, the key leaders are uh, more boys than girls. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I'm so glad you're on this uh, this evening. So um, 
I think one of the most important ways to kind of combat that sticky floor or the hesitancy, or I don't think of myself as a leader, especially in that age group, is really to just assign jobs or tasks or roles to young women uh, to kind of take the questioning out of it, take the inner dialogue that she might be having with herself, take the wondering, or it might not even be on her radar at all. But that's where I think you as a leader probably have a really strategic opportunity to be like, hey, why don't you give the announcements and why don't you go ahead and lead that trip? And why don't you go, you know, why don't you organize those people over there? And if you assign them leadership tasks and they start performing them, then it becomes so much easier to affirm leadership in them. And they even see themselves as, uh, in, uh, as well, I'm good at organizing, but I'm not good at leading. And then you can reframe that to actually, that's a lot of what leadership is. It's organizing people, it's organizing ideas, it's organizing resources. You're a great organizer and that makes you a great leader. And really connecting the dots between the experience or that maybe that helper profile that they've grown up in connecting mm -hmm. the dots of who they know themselves to be to who they also are, which is a leader. So it's, mm -hmm. it's less about like, you're not this, you're this. And it's more about actually, let's talk about how this is that this is actually what that is. Also, you just maybe didn't realize you were doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Yes, I think also um, any leadership teachings you can do, um, and particularly around female leaders from the Bible and naming them as leaders, Ken talked about several earlier. Mm -hmm. I, uh, one of the things that we found is most uh, weekend messages just don't involve very many women from the Bible. <laughs> we, you know, <laughs> teach a lot of lot of a lot of content. We teach a lot of examples. We don't often teach women. And uh, I always talk about my experience as being growing up in a wonderful church. I, I loved my church. It was an incredible place to grow up, but it was what I call a skip to verse 12 church. So when the pastor got up to give the message, he would read the passage that he was going to teach from and about verse three or four, he would, he would say, okay, skip to verse 12, just to be efficient, you know, and get to the point. Well, somewhere between verse four and 12 are all the women. And I just had no idea how many women were in scripture until I was in college. And I read through the whole Bible. Um, a woman who was discipling me challenged me to read through the whole Bible in a year, which I did for the first time. And I was like, there are so many women in here. I had no idea. And so many more options than being a mom or a prostitute. Those were like the only two scriptural role models I had growing up. And so a lot of times what you might be seeing for these girls is they just aren't exposed to all the options and all that God has for them in scripture. And it takes someone really pointing it out um, because you're fighting against sort of the narrative that they've grown up with. But it doesn't take long to spark a fire in someone when you hear what Miriam did or you see that Phoebe was carrying the book of Romans. It, it shifts young women's mindsets when you just highlight them. Sometimes in just a small devotional can go a really long way to just open up up, uh, people's minds and those young men to realize that there are women serving in high capacity spaces in scripture and to open their minds to see these sisters as partners in ministry at this age. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, pastors. It was wonderful to have you join us. I just want to remind everybody that, um, if you go into katiecole.com um, and, and you order the book today, you get a discount. Unfortunately, I don't have the discount code off the top of my head. Sorry, Katie and Renee. But I did put Renee's email in the chat. So um, you can get the discount by um, e emailing Renee, Renee Miller, who works at katiecole.com, Katie Cole and Company. Um, Katie, we want to give you the last word. Um, mm -hmm. But we just also thank you so much. This has been so inspiring for all of us. And we are just so grateful to know you and to know your work. And we feel like we have a call to action after this discussion this evening. Mm. So we will Thank leave you. you with the final word. Thank you so much. I do just want to say, um, I would love for you to go to the website. There's a ton of free materials on there. Um, some things that match the book, some podcast things that you might find really helpful. And I do a newsletter once a month of resources around women in leadership. So if that is interesting to you, um, please feel free to sign up for that. So um, I think my last thoughts, I would love to just say something to both the men and the women on this call. Um, to my sisters out there who are leading, I just want to encourage you to please stay in the game. Uh, most people don't get to see what I am seeing in God's kingdom right now. The number of people, leaders, 
churches who are hungry to do something different and are making enormous strides in it, uh, promoting women, giving them titles they should have had years ago, uh, elders, teams of elders apologizing to women for the challenges they faced, giving back pay to women of, because they were underpaid for so long, just incredibly concrete steps, and then really a lot of stirring in people's hearts. And so uh, I'm more encouraged than ever, and I know it's challenging, um, and it is it is an uphill battle, especially if you've been leading for a long time. I just want to encourage you not to give up. We are really seeing some incredible work that the Holy Spirit is doing. Uh, and then to all of my brothers out there who are listening and would come on this call or who are trying to do a better job with this, thank you so much. Uh, your small efforts mean a lot to us and your big efforts change our lives. And so thank you for leaning into the conversation. Thank you for being willing to help people uh, uh, when we are not able to open up those doors for ourselves or nominate ourselves for opportunities or be invited into things like this. Ken, thank you for being a champion and and just even highlighting this issue. The more we talk talk about it. And the more we uh, champion each other, the stronger the kingdom becomes. So thank you uh, for doing that. And Ken and Sarah, thank you so much for tonight and for including me in this series. Katie, thank you. God bless you. Everyone, thank you so much for joining in. Please check out gordonconwell.edu. Uh, you may want to take a class online. You may want to learn more about this. Uh, there's lots of information there as well as on uh, Katie Cole's uh, site as well. God bless you all and a very Merry Christmas tide to you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Have a great night.